Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Caleb. I'm one of the small group leaders here this morning. You might, uh, oh, I'll call it the moderate group. They're all gathered in the front here. I appreciate it. Um, I also do announcements here uh, from time to time. So if things go extremely poorly, we're going to pull out that connection card and we're going to go through it letter by letter uh, to fill the time. So there you go. I've, I've let you know what the backup plan is. So my, uh, my, my day job is that I am a, uh, I'm a genetics physician, which is a, a little bit unusual. And uh, Dirk and I sort of participated in the first job exchange program. So I spent the week here and he spent the week there. This is not true. So, <laughs> But uh, we're not exactly sure what he got into this week. So if you notice anything different about him, just hang in there. I mean, I'm not saying mutants, but, uh, you know, people are saying it. All right. So before we jump into things, let's pray real quick, and then we will get rolling. God, it is, uh, it is good to be here. You are God, and that is good. God, you are big. You are everything. You are everywhere. God, we are, we are deeply broken people, yet we are your children who you love. God, we thank you that you brought us here this morning. We thank you for your word, and we pray that you would speak through it here this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are going to be working uh, continually through Philippians, and we're going to focus on chapter 3 this morning. And one of the challenges whenever you talk is to try to find something that sort of pulls everybody together, something we can rally around. So I set the bar really, really low this morning, and we're going to all agree that we are here. We are physically here. I thought about saying we're all humans, but you never know, there might be a service animal, and then for our Roswell storming friends, maybe we're not alone. So we're going to just agree that we're all here. And there are lots of different reasons that we're here, and uh, I don't think anybody comes with one specific reason. Maybe you're here because of someone else that brought you, or maybe this is just what you typically do. Maybe you're really excited to hear God's word this morning. Um, That's wonderful. But I might be the only one, but I know I'm not, but I'll admit that maybe I'm the only one. I think sometimes we show up on Sundays because we think we might be doing God a solid. We might be just adding something to the scale, uh, the balance of, of good and evil for our life, that God will just be a little bit more appreciative and a little bit more thankful, a little bit more uh, honoring of us because we physically showed up here on Sundays. I'm the only one that does that, right? Right? All right, well, I'm up here speaking this morning, so I put a huge thing on my scale, so the rest of my week I can just go out and do whatever I want because I balanced it out, right? Okay, so we bring things to God that we think he's going to be happy with. We bring things to him that we think he's going to be proud of, and we put it on ourselves. And Paul is no exception to that, and in Philippians 3, he's going to lay out some of the things that he brought to God that he felt or things that would make him worthy. So let's also remember the context that Paul is, uh, is speaking to the Philippians in. This is a church that he has planted. This is a church that he cares deeply for. This is a church that has supported him financially uh, on multiple occasions. And he is writing to them uh, to thank them and to also encourage them and to teach them. And one of the big themes of Philippians is unity. And one of the challenges of having a united group is our motivations. Why do we do things, uh, and what makes that happen? So let's uh, look at Philippians 3. Uh, We're going to start in uh, verse 4. Uh, There are Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you if you want to grab that. This is on page 819. I think it's always important to see the words in the Scripture to know that we're not just pulling things uh, out from here and there. Let's uh, let's look together. So starting in verse 4, about halfway through, if someone else thinks they have more reason to put confidence in the flesh, this is Paul speaking, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So let's unpack that together, and we'll kind of take the phrases little by little. So first, what Paul lays out for us is circumcised on the eighth day. So great, you have the doctor up there, and he starts with circumcision, huh? (laughs) So I was thinking, though, I'm probably the only one that's ever stood on this stage that has actually performed a circumcision, unless there's some sort of weird seminary class that they, like, do on the weekends. Um, But that's not what we're into here, all right? So circumcision in the Bible starts back in Genesis 17 with Abraham. And God commands Abraham to circumcise himself and the rest of the people. And this wasn't just some sort of like secret handshake or password, a way to get into the club. This was, this was a representation of what would happen 
if the covenant that God made with Abraham was broken. But it's very important to remember that God called Abraham righteous before circumcision even happened. So what circumcision ends up being is just an act or a symbol. And yes, it was a very powerful and painful symbol, but as all traditions do from time to time, it faded. There's sort of a, a story that talks about a, a remote uh, a group of people that came and worshipped at a, as a, as a giant dry riverbed. And, and people sort of wondered, why were they there? Well, it turns out that generation after generation, they had gone to that place because once there used to be a giant, powerful, flowing river, but it was no longer there. So the bed lacked the power of the river, but the people were still there. So I've grown up a, sort of a, a denominational mutt. I counted them up, and over my church-going years, I've been through seven different, de- seven different denominations. And I have seen a variety of ways of dressing up here. I worked really hard to find something to wear this morning, and I, I, I think it worked out okay. But I have, seen, I have seen robes. I have seen the suit. I have seen things more casual. I've seen flip-flops up here. My mother-in-law loved the flip-flops the week that that happened. I hope she's not watching this. <laughs> From a worship perspective, right? Boy, there are sure lots of different ways to do worship. There's the choir, there's the organ, there's the bell choir. When I was young, my dad uh, used to like conduct up front with the arm like this. My favorite was Victory in Jesus. That was my favorite one that we sang. Um, and you have more modern expressions of worship from guitars. And my personal favorite is the electronic drum kit where you can hear them hitting the pads over the actual sound of the drum. That's my favorite way to worship. Um, none of these things are bad things, though. They're often, often things to be treasured, things to be enjoyed, things to be celebrated. But what happens is good things become ultimate things. And circumcision is all over the Bible as an example of that because it was a symbol. It was a very good intended thing that became an ultimate thing. If you want to read a little bit more about that, Romans 4 is a complete takedown of circumcision by Paul because it had become a source of salvation rather than a sign of salvation. So let's keep, walk, let's keep walking through this together. So picking up um, again where we left off. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So all throughout the Bible, there are lots of uh, family trees that get listed. Um, you know these because when you get two of them in the Bible reading plan, you're like, all right, I get out really quick today because I can just like skim these. But if you're like me, then I feel guilty that there's probably something really spiritual in these people's names. But then I eventually give up because I can't pronounce any of them anyways. Um, but what these are and why they're included in, in, in the scriptures is that they were a reminder to the people of God's, of God's presence over the generations, over the, the lineage that he had given given them. And Benjamin, which Paul traces his ancestry to, was a very, very important group, an important tribe. They were the, uh, the tribe that was loyal to David when things went crazy, when David was king. Benjamin is where the city of Jerusalem was eventually located at. And if you'll remember, the very, very first king was from the tribe of Benjamin. And do you remember what the first king's name was? It was Saul. And who's Paul named after? He's named after Saul. So this is a big deal where he came from. But again, these family origins and family histories became more. They became a sense of false reassurance for the people. So I work in genetics, and one of the things that we do is sort through family things a lot of times. And from time to time, genetics will reveal that someone's family isn't really their family. Maybe dad isn't who you thought it was. And that really throws families for a loop. To have something that they've always held on to and known it was normal completely taken away from them. So I'm not trying to offend anybody if you're into genealogies or you like uh, if you've swabbed your cheek and done the Ancestry.com thing. We should talk about that later. But uh, do what you want to do. But remember that uh, your background, your family, it can't save you. And that's really hard to hear sometimes because a lot of us come from incredibly kind, holy backgrounds of families that have loved us and raised us and nurtured us, but the families that we come from cannot save us in themselves. For me as a parent, this is a huge, huge challenge because what I want more than anything for my children is for them to personally know and accept the saving power of Jesus. But there's nothing that I can personally do to make that happen. There's a pastor, Pastor Matt Chandler, and he uses an analogy that I really like with parents and kids, is that we can pile up kindling wood around our children over and over, but we can't light the match. So again, 
think about the families that we come from, the things that we do, the things that we have been blessed with from our families, but that's never going to be enough. So both of these things that we've talked through here, circumcision and sort of family background, most of these are essentially out of our control. They're things that we don't always even have a say in. But let's flip those and see God's goodness in that. So maybe you were never wanted by your family. Maybe you were told that, or maybe it was just implied over time. Maybe things were messy for you growing up, and the idea of God as your father is really hard. Maybe family hasn't ended up being what you thought it was going to be, and your past just seems too much, much, too much to handle. The good news there is that none of that matters, because it's not about you. It's never been about you, and that's a good thing. That's going to be our thesis for today. Stephen Lawson, who's a commentator in the, in the book of Philippians, points out that everyone is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that was Paul's experience, and that's our experience. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All right, let's keep walking together. So next Paul says, in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. So I want you to remember that wasn't quite as much of a loaded term back then as it is now. And what it required to be a Pharisee was a lifelong process of learning and altering your behavior because of what you learned. It was an all-encompassing lifestyle, and it was a lifestyle based on very good things, based on the pursuit of God's law and what he says. We think of a lot of people nowadays that we celebrate for their dedication. Think about athletes and the, the, the toil and the work that they put into refining their, their body to be able to participate in the sport. We think about activists who, who feel passionately about something and dedicate their entire life to it. These are very, very good things. But again, good things become ultimate things. Because the issue with the law, which the Pharisees studied, is that the law was meant to be unkeepable. The point of the law was to show that we need a greater solution, and that was Jesus. Jesus himself, when he hung out with the Pharisees, he proclaimed woes on them. And this is, this is in Matthew 23, where he talks about they're, they're striving to be a, a cup or a bowl that's polished and nice looking on the outside, but inside it's rotting. There's nothing that we can dedicate our lives to that will gain us salvation apart from Christ. If you dedicate your life to world peace, Poverty and the cure of cancer, those are all very, very good things. But if that's what your life's about and that's what it's dedicated to, that's never going to be enough. So let's flip this one too, as far as the law goes. Maybe the names and the stories in the Bible are completely foreign to you, and the worst thing that someone could ever ask you to do was to look up a verse in the Bible, right? Or maybe if someone mentions the minor prophets, you think that those were ones that were written by people 18 or under. Okay, all right, there we go. We're still alive. All right. All right, okay. If you memorized every word of the Bible, which is exactly what the Pharisees did, you would not have enough to talk your way into salvation. Again, to go back to where we came from, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So Paul next says, as for zeal, again, this is sort of in the, in, in the vein of the Pharisees, as for zeal, persecuting the church. So again, Paul takes this to the next step. He didn't just believe what he had read and what he had learned. It was a personal passion, and he put action into it. Paul took this and actually went out and persecuted the Christian church because he was so convinced that what he was doing was right. And in, in reality, the, the law, the Old Testament law that pointed to Jesus was pretty intolerant of other things. So Paul was following what he had learned, but he had certainly taken it taken it to the extreme. And again, this is not a bad thing to be passionate and to put your feet where your mouth is. If we see an injustice in the world, we, we, are, we, we seek to change, to change the law, to bring about a change. Certainly many wars over the millennia have been fought for good or bad reasons, but many of them come from a, a deep-seated feeling that something is unjust and needs to be uh, corrected. Unfortunately, today in our culture, we have lots and lots of examples of people doing pretty horrific things because of something that they believe in so deeply. And Paul is, 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 is in some ways no exception to that. He was, a, he was sort of a, he was a, a coat taker at a stoning for Stephen. And if we think about that, this is what makes God so amazing because he takes people like Paul and he saves them 
and he uses them. And that's the same for us. No one is irredeemable for God, no matter what you've done. And maybe that's something that, uh, maybe that's the only thing that you need to hear this morning. God is fully aware of what you've done and what you're capable of. No one in this room may ever find out, but God is fully aware and he's not surprised. But he still loves us and he still offers each and every one of us the free gift of salvation. So lastly, Paul's going to say, as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. So Paul followed the rules. He was good at following the rules. And he says he was essentially perfect. He kept all of them. But the question we have to ask is, was he following the right rules? So I really like to follow directions, particularly when I'm building something. I'm the person, I actually look at the page that tells you how many of each screw there is, and I lay them out just to make sure that I got what the box said it was going to show. So I, I like that. Have you ever bought something, maybe it was on Amazon because it was cheap, and you get it, and you're reading the directions, and they're clearly not written by someone who English was their first language. You just kind of get that vibe, and you get to a place, and the directions just simply don't make sense. There is no way that even if you really want to follow the directions, you're going to be able to pull this off. Well, I think one of the greatest challenges in the modern-day Christian uh, church is that I think many times we are working off of bad directions. We have been uh, indoctrinated with this false notion that if we follow the rules, that one, two, three things are going to happen. And experience will tell you that is just not the case. You can follow all the rules that you want to find holiness in that, and that will never be enough. But again, that's the point that God's making with all this. The rules aren't the point. It's about the relationship. It's about the relationship that we have with God. We can't keep the rules, and they're never going to satisfy us. So we talked about things that were outside of control, but what we talked through here is things that were inside Paul's control. There's a commentator, Warren Wearsby, one of my favorites, and he says that none of these things that Paul has listed are bad things. But Paul had enough morality to stay out of trouble, but he didn't have enough righteousness to get into heaven. These very good things kept him away, and he had to lose his religion to find salvation. It's a lot harder to acknowledge our needs for salvation when we've generally been good people. I think a lot of times we're like kids who are doing art and they like uh, do some art and they give it to you and maybe you try to be nice, but like it's not really that great, but like you try to be nice and if it's someone else's kid, you try to be polite and then you say like, oh, I'm going to take it home, but then you throw it in your car. I think a lot of times we're like kids making art for God and we say, God, look, look, look what I did, look what I did and it's, it's not that great in God's perspective. But let's flip this as well to be convinced of God's goodness. Maybe you're unsure about faith. Maybe you're just taking baby steps here. Maybe righteousness couldn't be any further away from you. Maybe what you did last week or last night, you wouldn't want anyone to know about. I've heard it joked about that if you knew the person who was sitting next to you better, you'd hold your purse a little bit closer in church. Paul had everything except for what he actually needed. So let's keep walking ahead in the scripture together. So picking up in verse 7, a key word, but. God has, Paul has listed all these things that he brings to the table, and he says, aha, let's hold here. And I want you to notice he's going to use a lot of math terms here, because what he's kind of doing is he's kind of walked us through his trophy room, and he said, these are all the things that I have. And now he turns to us and says, let's do a pro and cons list. Let's do a balance sheet here and see how it weighs out. So what he says in verse 7, but. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What changed here? Paul met Jesus. Paul tells us elsewhere in his writings that he was literally made blind so that he could see. Jesus personally came to Paul and said, why are you persecuting me? And what changed in Paul was his heart. It was his perspective. It was who he was serving it wasn't just getting more things for himself. It was letting go of those things, and it was Christ alone. Paul isn't just changed, he's transformed. He still has all the things that he's listed for us now, but he's now using them and directing them elsewhere. 
Because what God does when he comes to us is he doesn't just take away the bad. He takes what's good in us and he uses that. So Paul continues in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So Paul's getting pretty aggressive here with his words, and he's just reinforcing what he just said. And he's saying, this isn't just a loss. This is actually rubbish. This is, this is the poop emoji of the Bible here. It says, this is classic youth pastor uh, lesson here, right? God says it's poop, all right? Because <coughs> when we come in our own strength, we bring God garbage. Because it's not about what we have. That's never going to be enough. It's not just about knowing Jesus either, because the Bible tells us even the demons know who Jesus is. It's about knowing him. So Paul finishes in this section for this morning. And we're going to read a long chunk here together, so hang with me. So he talks, that I might gain Christ and that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. It's the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have been taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? Does, does the hair on the back of your neck stand up a little bit when you read that? That is good stuff. This is why we come together. This is why, this is why we have freedom because of what God did. What we see in this passage is we see death for life. We see garbage for glory. We see our sin for his sufficiency. We see our man-made strength for resurrection power. And we trade in the participation ribbons of this world for the prize of Christ. Can I get an amen there? There we go. All right. So there's two comments I want to talk about in this particular section. One, suffering. Paul's straight up about it. Remember where he's writing this from is the epitome of suffering. What a soothing balm for when things are hard in life, that God has not left us. He has not abandoned us. We can know that we are never outside of God's will, even when things are hard. The Bible, unfortunately, is not a promise of a happy, clappy life. There's no apostles cruise sponsored by K-Love to the Caribbean. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> the second thing. How often is Christ mentioned in what we just read there? Faith in Christ, knowing Christ, taking hold of Christ, being called heavenward in Christ. Why? Because he's the point, guys. Let's go back to the thesis statement that we talked about. We're not the point. We've never been the point. And that's a good thing. And now at the risk of uh, switching everything, I want to add something to that thesis statement. What are we going to do about it? It can't just be faith, and it can't just be works. It has to be both. And I'll acknowledge up front that is hard. And when James talks a lot about this in his book of the Bible, and in the message translation, he talks about separating faith and works, you just end up with a corpse. Lawson, again, commenting on this section, says, good works flow from faith, but they do not produce it, and they can never be a substitute for it. But let's wade in a little bit with what are we going to do about it. I'm going to give you two things. These are not deep uh, theo uh, the uh, theological truths that I have to build a proof around, and they're things that I say to you as much as I say to me. Number one, read your Bible. It's been really hard getting ready for this and knowing that I was going to talk about this because I don't do it nearly as much as I should. 
If you're not reading your Bible, we've just focused on 10 verses this morning. Start there. We've been going through Philippians for the last couple of weeks. We're going to keep going there next week. Start over at the beginning of Philippians and work through that. If Philippians works for you, Galatians kind of flows from that, so go there. If you're kind of new to all this, start with Acts or pick a gospel. Read your Bible, people. Read your Bible, Caleb. If you claim to be a Christian and it doesn't bother you that you're not reading your Bible, I would just want to ask why it doesn't bother you a little bit. If you're one of those people and you're streaking on your phone with the Bible app, awesome. Don't let it just be something that you scroll through. Don't let your thumb drive that. If you sit down and you read, fantastic. Keep doing that. Add a resource to that. This is the commentary that I use kind of getting ready for today. These don't have to be thick theological uh, treatises, but they can be extremely helpful. This has probably been the thing that's changed my Bible reading the most in the last three years was adding just a little bit extra when I'm studying. And lastly, if when you read the Bible, you have books spread all over the place like you're studying for finals, that is awesome. But make sure that you're reading for relationship and not just information. Let's read our Bible. The second one, hopefully shouldn't be too much of a surprise, pray. This one is harder because it's a little bit more difficult to nail down and say tangible things about it. And I know it's kind of overdone in church sometimes when we talk about it, but what kind of relationship do you have with God if you never talk with him? If you have a friend and you never talk, are they really your friend? Maybe you don't know how. I get it. It is hard. Start there with God and bring that to him. Let that be the start of the conversation. God, I don't know how to pray. And see where that goes. Remember, you don't have to come to God formally with your these and thous and thys. You don't have to come in your Sunday best. You don't have to come when it's been a while since you've sinned. You, we can bring our brokenness to God in prayer, and he meets us there. I would encourage you to ask somebody for help because you know what the chances are? They probably stink at prayer too. And then at least you're not in it alone. There's a prayer table in the back. It's like 50 feet to get there. That's pretty close. And lastly, if you're looking for something a little bit more tangible, Tim Keller has a fantastic book on prayer. If you read Keller before, he's deep. But this is a, this is a, this is a get up in your business kind of book about prayer. So I think uh, for myself, one of the major objections to Bible reading and prayer is time. And I went through a study a couple years ago called Experiencing God, and there was something in there that sort of hit me over the head like a two-by-four, two and it said, we don't have a time management problem. We don't have issues with our time. We just straight up have a love problem. Because what it comes down to for me and I'm going to infer you, is I just don't love God enough to choose to spend time with him many times. When I go through a day and haven't had time in my Bible and time praying, I can look back on that day and think of lots of other things that I chose to do instead. So let's put a bow on that and move ourselves away from works, because again, that would violate what we were getting at this morning. And what we want to do is we want to look back at what Paul said to us. And we've looked at it in the context of what Paul said, and we've tried to uh, look at it for ourselves and say, what about myself in this can I see? But I think what's most important for us here this morning is to see Christ in this passage. So we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the beginning where we read in Philippians. And we're going to have the words up there from the Bible, and I'm going to sort of riff over top of them, and hopefully you can follow along with where I'm going here. I want you to see Christ in this. So back to Philippians 4, seeing Christ. If anyone else thinks that they have a reason to put confidence in the flesh, Christ has more. He is the fulfillment of the covenant that circumcision represents. He is the long-promised king of Israel. He is the lion of Judah. He is the Hebrew of all Hebrews. In regard to the law, he is the fulfillment. He is the completion. The law is no longer needed because of Christ. As for zeal, he was right 
and holy. Think of him flipping the tables and driving out the folks with the whip. None of us can do that in the right spirit, my friends. He created the church. He is the bridegroom of the church. As for the righteousness that's based on the law, Jesus is that new covenant. For whatever was a gain to him, he lost for our sake. And what is more, he considered everything a loss, even taking it to the cross, that we might know Christ Jesus our Lord. He took on our sin, he took on our garbage, that we could find refuge in him. Not having a righteousness that comes from our background or our traditions or our education, our actions or how moral we are, but we have Christ's righteousness that is given to us freely. We now know Christ and we have the power of that empty grave. That does not mean that it is easy because we participate in his suffering even to our death. But come what may, my friends, we will also leave an empty grave. So let's stand together and we're going to finish this passage out together. We're going to finish Paul's words in our own, starting in verse 12. Let's read together. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Friends, it is good to finish our time together by reading the scripture together. Because if we go back to our thesis, he is the point. He has always been the point. And that's the best thing. And look what he did about it. So let's press on together. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads in this place where we've had a chance to... Uh, hear God's word, reflect on God's word, and to consider what it means for each, and, uh, each one of us personally, I would challenge you to think about where your heart is at right now and what you are bringing to God and thinking that it's going to be enough. And if you're not bringing him nothing and depending on him wholly, let this be the morning where you let go of the things that you're bringing and take hold of what he is offering. If you need to slip out and find your way back to the prayer table while we pray, you go ahead and do that. Don't let this morning, don't let the people next to you, don't let anything else get in the way of being right with God in this place and in this time. God, you are everything. You've always been everything and you always will be. And God, for some reason, you chose us as your children. You chose to create us even though you knew, you knew, God, that we would mess up almost immediately. And God, that wasn't the end of it. You prepared a way for a long, long time for us to become right with you. And then you sent your son to finish it. God, we live in the death of Christ and nothing else. God, help us to understand that. Help us to be convicted of that. Help us to change what we're doing and who we are because of that. Because God, that's actually what matters. And this day and then the next day and for all of eternity, you are the only thing that matters. We pray to you in Christ's name. Amen.